Hi, I'm Kylie. And I'm Jamie. And we're here to announce the winning entries to the Lost Words dialect writing competition that was run by The Word in late 2019. Entrants were tasked with writing a short story which celebrated the North East dialect and they were able to use a bank of over 2,400 donated dialect words and phrases which were collected by the word at their previous Lost Dialect exhibition. We will announce the top three entries from the adult competition and the top two entries from the competition for young writers aged 12 to 19 years old. So sit back and enjoy the stories. A Canny Day Out by Paul Main. You'll have need to hold the same, many a mickle makes a muckle. Now it's so true as when we're talking about bilberries. It takes donkey's years to fill a basket or a pail with enough for a pie or a tart. It's not just that they're deed titchy or that they hide away from you, it's just you cannot stop eating them. They've got a taste like any other. The blueberries you get in the shop are watery. Bilberries explode in your mouth. It makes for slow progress in the gathering. I was up with the Grand Bends in one of the best places for Bilberries, the hill up to the Drake Stone. Purple handed, purple moothed, go made our way to the stone, hunk at dune to watch the clouds scud our harbour. What a bonny place. We went out of the top to the loft. Dark, deep, ghosty. I brought to mind an odd tale about when they tried to drain the loft. The walkman heard a voice from nowhere. Let alone, let alone, or I'll droon a hard bottle and the peels and the bonny holy stone. They got such a glyph, they ran, muckle fiat. I could well understand why. So we made our way, tappy lappy, doing the hill to the car park. Lightning my load as we were gannin' along. Mind, I says, dim gan and eat them all. Granny's gonna make a lovely bilberry tart when we get yam. Not quite like it, you know. Crusty brune pastry, a sprinkle of sugar on top, and evaporated milk to help it all doon. Get yourself on the good side of that, you'll come to knee harm. By the time we got to the car, it was blana hooly, and we just managed to get my boots off and inside before the rain came stopping doon. Why no, I says, wasn't that good to get the stink blan off you? A bit of history and mystery up by the Drake Stone, and we'll pick what own supper and all. The little un said, Granda, I'm very cold and I need the lavatory. Living doing sooth, a sharp got shot of the northern Broughtons up. I could tell he was Boston, so I says, Why, there's nae netties wound here, hinny, but there's plenty of trees. Just gone to that one over there. Nobody will keek. The rain had ease off to a mizzle, and I watched him trudge to the farthest tree he could and disappear ahint the trunk. I taunted Noah. The eldest. He already had his phone out and was tapping git fast with his bilberry fingers. Did you enjoy yourself this morning, pet? Yes, thank you, Grandad. Uh, but I want to finish this bit of my game, if that's all right. Posh tark. Lovely manners. Certainly, Hinny. What are you playing? It's called Grand Theft Auto. It's very exciting. I thought to myself, well, I could play that in real life. Just leave the tractor unlocked and then chase the thief and out to me Land Rover like Tommy Heppel did. I didn't share that thought. It didn't end our well for Tommy. William came back, clots up to his oxters. Granda, I slipped and fell in the mud and dropped my bilberries. He looked as miserable as sin. So you've coped your creels and lost your catch. Wet arse and knee fish. I have to say, that raised a smile from both. Talking of fish, what about we're going to get some fish and chips on the way yem? We'll get some scrunchings and all. We're both them doing, and I found out on the way back that Noah had eaten all of his gatherings. Well, I hadn't bothered to pick any, thinking the bends could do the lot. Me back was bad and all, so I wasn't looking forward to telling Grandma about the failure. But when we opened the door, she had a penny on. And there was a lovely smell coming from the kitchen. You'll never guess, she says. Helen's man Jimmy just brought us a whole load of bilberries. He came across them when he was out on his rounds. I've made a lovely tart for afters, but I've had no time to cook a meal. I thought you could get some fish and chips for tea. How does that sound? 
were all nodded. The hear nae, see nae, speak nae monkeys. At least we would taste a bilberry tart after all. Landfill by Sarah Lenthal. I strike the match, gan up in a blast, engulfed in flames that rage, spit, sparks, neurons fire and visions start. The landfill. Smells cling to me neb from years of work, hands black, knacked, always hurt. The earth's ripped up and sore, a gob which we gag and gorge. This shrink-wrapped, vacuum-packed, plastic generation absent-mindedly ranges war against Mother Nature, a build-up of pressure, a spark of anger, a deep-seated fire that burns in the barren belly of the oppressed, a warning to the oppressor. Then a face flickers. War lass. She said she'd never gone that way, packed up in a box, buried away. But cancer burnt through her body, settled in her gut. I see her there, her windswept hair, the sting of tears, her sorrow-worn face as the doctor conformed were worst fears. Now I'm at New Biggin Shore, 31 years later, an uproar, a sperm whale washes up in the bitter card. Last breath, after days of us watching a slow death. Even the moon and sea can't pull her back. Left on shore for us all to go, but crowds gather haphazard, there to mourn and contemplate. Was it something we did? The Coast Guard stands vigil, tells tales of men with pliers who tear teeth from roots, rip skin to ribbons, strip flesh from ribs, and use them as archways hang from walls. It's all been done before. They cordon off the area because our stomach's swollen, not with a bend but a risk of explosion. 220 puns of plastic pulled from her gut. Then it's announced she'll be sliced up and dumped. A stab of shame. She shouldn't gone this way. Nay dignity in death, chopped up and thrown away. So I protest, I'm cautioned, creating unrest. They cuffed me wrist, so I bite me lip. But I snuck about the sorry dark, ready to leave me mark. Her skin's gashed. Wounds are deep, reds, pinks, whites, ooze and weep. I douse her in petrol, pour it in deep, strike a match, watch it catch. Back to the burning monk, sets himself ablaze, unyielding face strong in the smoky haze. A grisly act of protest, they said. Saw the picture, read the paper, didn't think it'd be a beacon so many years later. Old enough to remember, too young to understand. The fire roars, claws at me skin as though I'm there in that foreign land. But I'm here and listen. A moment of clarity. Was this the right thing to do? Aye. To make a point. To take a stand. We'll pollute the ocean, stuff the land, and now we want to butcher the whale and take it to landfill. No. Nah. For the mothers and the mothers that never were. For war lass. For the doctor saying it's only a matter of time before the next riddled body is mine. Only seconds have passed, locals run doon the sands, squealing en masse. Sat astride a fiery whale, I inhale and up we gone. The sky is the sea, the clouds, the waves. We've made it. The landfill won't become our graves. Echoes by Barbara Williams. The words were the first thing that went. My name disappeared one Sunday in the sitting room, like it had sunk into the green velvet cushions or been obscured in the patterned chintz of the wallpaper. She was sitting in her usual armchair by the window, looking down at me as I lay pronate in front of the fire. I watched her, searching for it. Her mouth opened, but it wouldn't come. Her lips pursed in frustration. Silence stretched between us, unspooling like a cobweb. I knew I should smile, but my face couldn't hear. 
It was raining outside, or teeming, as Nana would say, wrapping the windows in a bleary blanket that obscured the back garden and smothered the occasional scream of car engines in the back lane. Granda shifted uncomfortably on the three-piece as Nana and I stared at each other. Barbara, he prompted. But my name had evaporated, washed away in the rain. It was replaced by Dolly, a comfortable mitten that slid easily over any missing digit. From that point on, we were all Dolly, even my brother. Nana was a lot of things, but mostly she was a voice. She was the E in excitement, the cuddly C in canny, and the disparaging tuts in worky ticket and picture nuisance. She was never tired, but jiggered. Never ran, but skeetered. She announced herself with an idiosyncratic yoo-hoo, assured us she was on her way with a as a coming, and signed off with a dependable bye Dolly. We weren't her grandchildren, we were the Bairns. It sounded like a smile and felt like a verbal embrace. Her words staked her claim to us. No family member was a floating individual but War Ronnie or War Janet. Her idiolect was the soundtrack of our childhood. A patchwork quilt passed down generations. When my name disappeared, the first stitch became loose and the patches began to separate, leaving gaps or disappearing entirely. They'd turn up unexpectedly in the wrong sentence or in the mouth of my mother, inflicting painful stabs of recognition, hot as a needle. Nana's words tied us not only to each other, but to our home. They lurked in the ground like Roman treasures, echoing off the cobbled streets of her childhood, covered in coal dust, salty with sea air. When I took them to university, they were scorned by southerners who thought their ingredients unrefined, pretending not to understand this speaker from a foreign land. They weren't welcome in essays or seminars, and I wondered if they'd die out completely. As her words slipped away, my nana was replaced by a young girl I didn't recognise, who searched for her mam in the streets long demolished. Mam was one of the last words to go, along with hinny, a word her own mother had bestowed. Just as they had once bound us to her, now they were gone, she was adrift, unable to fathom her connection to the woman calling her nana. She stared out at me, locked in behind the cheekbones she had bestowed, frightened and lonely. Eventually, our words mutated too. Nana and Grandas contracted to Grandas, and home took on a painful duality. Nana regressed back through the names from which she'd graduated, swapping Florence for Flory, eventually curtailed to Flo, a curtailing of letters that reflected her dwindling days. We conversed around her, the words swirling before her watery eyes like the old sitting room wallpaper. Our attempts to interact ricocheted off her blank countenance with only glimmers of recognition on her chalky face. Like the blackboard at school with its faint ghost letters that resisted the complete oblivion of the wiper. Following the words through the neck of the hourglass, the rest of her gradually disappeared too. Her red hair lost its vibrancy, her body wasted, and her spine curved until she bent like a flower under snow. Throughout the agony of erasure, one of her phrases played in my head on repeat. Had a way and loss yourself. I wondered if she already had, and how much of us should take with her. The words failed in the black car that drove us to the creme. The air was heavy with the backlog of the unspoken. I fingered the sharp edges of the paper folded in my pocket. Eulogy. Standing alone at the front, I thought the words would never come. The letters swam on the page, dark and sharp against the white, nothing like her. As I willed the words past the lump in my throat, I wondered if this was how she'd felt that Sunday afternoon when my name had disappeared. Had she known that it would never come back? and that it was taking her with it. What would she say if she could? Would she have a message? Message had always meant something different to Nana. It was an errand she had to run, an item she had to source. 
She was always going on a message, often for other people. So I went on a message for her. I brought her words back. I told everyone we were her bairns, sometimes worky tickets, but mostly canny. And if ever we were in need, she'd skeeter to our assistance, even if she was jiggered. And suddenly, they were coming, as they're coming, filling my mouth like the delicious mix-ups of childhood, spilling forth a gluttony that had sustained us from the beginning. I said, bye, Dolly, one last time. Today, her voice echoes in mine. Her words survived university and came with me into the classroom, mixing with the delicacies offered by my students, who aren't angry, but ragy. Aren't laughing, but decked. The patchwork quilt reassembles itself with each successive generation. Different, but intact. With patches of our own and covering more of us. When I wipe the board clean, I think of her and smile, knowing the words will be back again tomorrow, formed from the outlines of their predecessors. Spoken Like Home by Lily Tibbetts. Declan Carr, right on time. Please take a seat. I haven't done anything wrong, sir, honest. I didn't say you had done something wrong. If anyone's called to your office, it's to get telt off, isn't it? It's told off, Declan, not telt. Same thing. Don't use that tone of voice with me, Mr. Carr. I only want to have a conversation about your most recent essay for English literature. Why does everyone think I'm being sarky? I'm not like. Anyways, what's that about me essay? You tell me, Declan. Muckle good, I thought. I thought, sir. I'll read. Muckle good, I thought, sir. Thank you. Yes, it was very good in terms of ideas and content, but I think you know what the problem is. Well, you wrote something about the language, but that's not the language per se, but the dialect. It's become quite clear that you're using a lot of idioms and phrases that you say out loud in your essays, which means I have to mark you down. Miss Ainsley said it's happening similarly in history. I told you I was going to get wrong. This isn't me telling you off, Declan. I was only going to suggest that perhaps this isn't the right school for you. Are you having a laugh? I know it isn't ideal, but this school is very prestigious, and I've got a place just like all the other posh toffs here. Mr. Carr, I understand that you haven't felt as if you fit in here. Oh, give how are you? Just said me writing's good. The London kids and all that aren't that mint, but I'm digging fine here, bunging. A few weeks ago, you punched another student. What's your point? Declan. Ah, read Simma Doon. That lad Jonesy, who's been a proper doylem leg, -like, said I should go back to where I come from like I'm a bloody immigrant or something. He's probably a reet racist twi- Declan. Anyhow, I got wrong for that ages ago. Me mum had to come doon just so I could get telt off in front of her. And Jonesy didn't get nothing. Guarantee if he came up north, well, he'd be up a height with his muckle stupid accent. Everybody would laugh in his face. Do you think so? Why, aye. You're divin' now up there like R.D. If you don't mind me asking, Declan, do you like where you come from? Of course. It's mint up there, like, honest. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out, Declan. If you liked it so much up there, then why did you come to this school? Divna, I think you do. Don't worry, this is strictly between the two of us. Look, well, my dad always wanted us to get a decent education and all that. Doing here, there's more chance, he said. But everyone will think you're reet stupid. No one thinks you're stupid, Declan. I reet. That's any bother. It just makes it muckle good when I prove them all wrong and I get some canny grades and a canny job. And what job do you want to get? Museum curator. A museum curator? Aye. And you can give our your raised eyebrow and all. I like history and English. 
looking at the culture of places and stuff, innit? There's an alternative course that we could look at. Places closer to home. So you're saying I should just go on the M? After all them lot have said about me accent? Nee chance. It's important, sir. Language and all that. That's what I want to study, cultures and dialect. I cannot do that if I speak like a posh toff and give up my only connection to home. So you're saying the culture is what's important to you? Now you're getting it. That's quite a unique perspective. Maybe it's for ye. You have to understand, Declan, that I can't fully give credence to you writing like this. It could impact your future school life and career massively. Only the people who can't be boshed looking past the accent. Declan. Sir? I think you should stay at this school. Really? Mint, sir. Just please don't punch any other students. And obviously, from a teacher's perspective, I have to ask you to stop using idioms in your essays. Bella, can I get out now? Get out now, sir. Aye, aye, I'll read. Can I get out now, sir? Yes, Declan. Keep working hard. Shut the door on your way out. Reet. See you later. Uh, oh, and Declan? Aye? Uh, have you ever considered becoming a lexicographer? Div now what one is, sir. A lexicographer compiles words for dictionaries. They look at what words are in usage in different areas and how language can change across a period of time. I think you would find it quite interesting. Sounds read up my street. Thanks, sir. See you the morrow. Uh, see you... <sighs> the morrow, Declan. Now you're getting it, sir. Imagine by Jess Muse. It was faint, but it could be heard. Not too far in the distance. The cry of pure joy. Round a thin, winding pathway guided by fir trees either side, came Mia. Now you've never seen anything like Mia. Mud everywhere, even in her hair. Scrapes and bruises from her head to her bare toes from all her wild adventures. With clothes she'd clearly grown out of and ripped to fit on. She had bright eyes though. Like the moon, not the sun. They glowed. You've never seen anything like Mia, and neither had I. She ran at such a speed, arms outstretched as if she was an aeroplane. I thought she was going to run straight through me. But she didn't. She came to a halt just a foot in front of me. We were the same height and probably the same age, not old enough to be out in the woods alone. Hiya, I'm Mia. Then she asked, as if she'd never seen another person before, Who are you? I didn't have time to answer before she spoke again. It's all right. I didn't need to know your name. You can still play with us. Howie, I've got something to show you. She gave me no choice but to follow her as she yanked my hand and led me away. We walked towards a clearing through a cover of trees. I continued to follow behind this very peculiar girl as I had the whole way there. She let go of my hand to push away the branches hiding our destination. All I could see was grass with two giant rocks dotted in the middle and the rest of the forest behind them. Mia ran excitedly over to these rocks and I have to admit, I was intrigued. What could she find so fun about being here? Standing at the foot of the biggest rock, my strange new acquaintance turned to me and admitted, People would think I'm a bloody barn pot for doing things like this. She began to climb the face of the rock. Good job there's nobody else here. A barn pot, I thought. When I looked back at her, she was halfway to the top of this rock and moving as agile as a cat. I rushed to the other side, awaiting her next move. She looked around, looked down at me with a smile, squatted slightly and threw herself off the top, striking a starfish pose in mid-air, then landed perfectly right next to me. It's geet fun! Try it! For some reason, despite sensing the crazy, I trusted her and began to ascend the rock. I hesitated when I got to the top. Peering over the edge, 
Mia somehow looked smaller than before, and the distance from me to the ground grew tremendously in my head. Jump! Mia shouted. And again, I trusted her. Ready? Go! she called. And I went, flinging myself off, forgetting to pose mid-air like she had, landing imperfectly next to Mia. Bet you chuffed you did that, she said, looking at me with a great big smile. I smiled back, because for whatever reason, I was chuffed. We spent the rest of the day running around and playing in the forest. Mia took me all around her little world. First, we climbed the tallest trees we could find, all the way to the top so we could see the view. So you got a man da? Mia asked me. I shook my head and she replied, neither do I, don't want them either. We picked flowers together and did cartwheels. I felt like we were free to do anything. That's probably why Mia liked living out here. She led me behind a giant bush. Right, get get low behind here. Scoot over a bit and shove up. We crouched, listening to all the sounds of the forest. It was magical. Where do you live? I just live here all on me tod since I was a bairn. It's mint. Absolutely Baltic on a night time though. Probably gonna have to divvy up me stuff now you're here as well. Watch the proggles through here, the bloody sting. She shared a rock collection with me and lay on the grass, looking up at the sky and laughing together. You probably think I blather, don't you? I'll stop for a bit, give your noggin a rest. I'm pagad anyway, are you? Wait, what's that over there? Mia cried. I peered in the direction she was looking. I had to squint my eyes to see it. I think it's a tunnel. Bagsy first wanted to explore. She ran over to the opening of a small tunnel that looked like two little trees had curled over to each other and formed an archway. She began to crawl through. Ew, I can't see anything in here, it's all claggy. Come on. She beckoned me to follow her. I waited for her to go through. How are you, numpty? She crawled all the way through the tunnel. Mia jumped up out of the end of the tunnel. In front of her was her dirty, cluttered living room. Empty beer bottles flooded the floor and there were piles of clothes and old takeaway boxes everywhere. Crashes and shouting could be heard in another room. She grabbed her rag doll. All Mia saw was fresh fields and the tallest, most beautiful trees in front of her. She started running faster than she ever had. She ran and ran through her living room, jumping off the sofa and swirling about. Mia couldn't stop smiling as she ran, doing cartwheels, whooping and laughing. She ran straight out of the front door, down the driveway and into the bonnet of a car.